So do you ever wonder how Apple chooses the accessories that they actually sell in the store? Because there's just so many accessories and you look at the walls on the Apple store and they're actually quite bare. I'm sure the accessory design guidelines for Apple devices has something to do with it. Not all of it, but I'm sure a bit of it. Personally, being a product reviewer, I find the selection at Apple Store to be somewhat lacking, but these guidelines will probably shed some light on why it's such a poor selection. Yes, buried on Apple's website is a set of suggestions, guidelines, that Apple provides to manufacturers when it comes to iPhone accessories or mobile accessories, any mobile device that's currently supported. The document itself is uh, quite dull. There aren't any you know, nice pictures, but there are a couple of interesting tidbits when it comes to cases. So in the next few minutes, I'm gonna go over some of the more interesting tidbits in this guideline. So I'll just, I'm not gonna talk about it all. I'm just gonna pull out the ones, little pieces that I thought were interesting. I'm gonna talk about some of the cases that I reviewed over the last few years that actually failed those guidelines. And then the last thing I'll talk about is why Apple is such a stickler when it comes to their devices and accessories. Real usage, real reviews. Mobile reviews, a dot CA. And mobile reviews, a Monty and I, this little dog, uh, base all our videos on actual usage. And with cases, we've been using cases, a lot of cases over the last few years. So finding a design guideline, <laughs> pretty cool. So I had to go read it all. So let's get started. Apple's accessory guideline is almost 200 pages and covers every mobile device that Apple currently supports. For this video, I'm just gonna talk about the cases for the iPhone 10s and 8s since they are Apple's newest. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about drop protection and the port access, screen access, screen protection, cameras, and color fastness. Now, right off the bat, Apple doesn't want metals or magnets in their accessories. Why? Because it might mess with the OIS or radios on Apple's device. Apple also says if your accessory really needs to have magnets or metal, keep it away from the antenna keepout regions, which are, well, these places. On the iPhone 10, the keepout areas on the back of the device are basically the tops and the bottoms of the device, about 50 millimeters at the top and 16 at the bottom, and the seven centimeter circle smack dab in the middle of the back. When it comes to drop protection, Apple wants the accessories to protect the device from a drop of one meter from any orientation on a flat, hard surface. So that's the minimum drop protection standard that Apple has laid out in the guidelines. Now, personally, I don't think any of the cases that I've reviewed over the last few years has failed at one meter. In fact, it does seem like the iPhone by itself has a pretty good chance of surviving a one meter drop on a flat surface from, well, I guess, waist height one meters. For cases, Apple specifically wants exposed glass on the device not come within one millimeter of a flat surface. So on everything prior to the iPhone 10, in the 8, so it was just, you know, the glass and the, the front and the camera. But on the newer devices, well, I guess the entire thing has to be one millimeter, at least one millimeter thick. But the odd thing is that with that requirement, they say Apple says that the polycarbonate used in the cases has to be 1.15 millimeter thick, at least. Now, there are several cases that would fail this guideline, which includes the Pataka, which is one of my favorite ultra thin cases, the Cotabi Veil vale XT, which is pretty awesome, and the Peel case, which is not as awesome. Much worse than the Veil XT, in my opinion. And one of the things I did do was measure all these cases. And well, I could tell you it's very difficult, even with an electronic measuring tool, to measure the thickness of iPhone cases. Now, as a side note, Mill Standard 810G says that iPhone sized devices should be protected from four feet or 1.2 meters of drop protection. So Apple's guideline for protection isn't as stringent as the Mill Standard 810G, but at least there is something. Now, from my perspective, this is kind of odd. Apple does lump access to the bottom of the iPhone with drop protection section and even starts that section with care should be given to the design of the bottom of the case. So apparently Apple's pretty serious about this section. When it comes to the size of the cutouts, Apple doesn't want the case bottom cutout to be any larger than the speaker, speaker grills, which means that the Pataka case fails again because there is an angle from the corner of the case. So this, well, <laughs> fail. And when it comes to screen protection or anything covering the screen of the iPhone, there were four guidelines that out of several that stood out to me. The first one was kind of odd. Apple says the accessory should not have any edges that can collect water on the touchscreen uh, when the Apple device is held at a 30 degree angle relative to the horizon. Now my interpretation of that guideline is that 30 degrees, they don't want, if you were to pour droplets of water, to not have the water pool. Now for me that seems very unlikely because water's going to pool, this is an Apple silicone case, and water's going to pool at the bottom of the case. Well, if you t if you flip it on the side where there's actually no cover over the speaker grills, then the, the water is gonna fly, come off. But if you uh, tip it at 30 degrees and you drop some water on the uh, front of the screen, it's gonna pull at the bottom. So I'm really not quite sure how this one would work, but again, it's kind of vague. 
and there aren't really videos for these guidelines. Uh, so, you know, these are, that's, it, you're leaving it up to my interpretation and then I'll make a video about it. But 30 degrees, it's kind of weird. Now the second guideline deals with the edges of the case. The case needs to provide a 120 degree angle of accessibility. Now this isn't much of a problem for most modern cases, I'll say, but I do remember seeing life-proof nudes in the Apple store for the fives and the edges on those cases were just so awful. Now I'm assuming that that guideline's probably gonna have a bit more attention to it now that we are starting to get into the iPhone 10 design mantra, which is, you know, Really big screen, no side of iPhone when compared to something like this 8 Plus. Now Apple does show that there's this funny test block that you can use to test the screen access. I couldn't get my hand on one, but there is that. The third guideline says that no material should cover the ambient light and proximity sensor, which means that most of the full cover screen protectors fail this guideline as well as every other waterproof case. But again, these are guidelines and not hard set rules. Now, since we're on the topic of screen protectors, Apple does recommend that the product's thickness be no more than 0.3 millimeters, which means that one of my favorite screen protectors were the sevens and eights, the patchwork silicate ITG glass would fail this guideline. There's a lot of stuff that fails these guidelines. Lines. And again, they're just guidelines, but still, a lot of them fail. The last screen guideline deals with the Touch ID, uh, with the case being required to be two millimeters away from that sensor. My guess is that Touch ID is gonna be phased out in the next few years for Face ID. And I wasn't gonna talk about this until I came across the Apple suggested test case uh, for cases that cover the Touch ID sensor, which involves hand sanitizer and sterile latex gloves. Yeah, kinky. Now when it comes to speakers, there are a ton of minute details involving both thin and thick cases. Apple says that the accessory should not change the frequency response of the speakers or microphones. The user should not hear any distortion or echoes, which means every waterproof case I have ever used ever fails this guideline. When it comes to thin cases, which Apple considers 2.25 millimeters or thinner, there needs to be an offset of at least two millimeters from the edge of any Apple device or microphone port. The inner diameter must no, be no more than 1.5 millimeter thick, and there must be a 45 degree incoming angle to the inner diameter. It also must sit flush against the Apple device. Now the diagram that they show in the guidelines is actually pretty clear, but right off the bat, I can tell you that this Cotomy Vail XT or any thin case fails this guideline. Meh. And it's stupidly thin. So this, the thinner the case is, the more likely it's going to fail most of Apple's guidelines. Now for thick cases, greater than 2.25 millimeters, Apple suggests that you have some sort of separator between the mic and speaker holes. If it's really thick, Apple suggests having an exit separator to ensure that the speaker and mic ports do not occlude. This is probably one of the most standout things about this Apple guideline is that I've only seen one case that has that sort of feature. And I saw, I reviewed it recently, it's this LifeProof Slam. LifeProof actually has a separator between the mic and the speaker parts of the iPhone. So out of all, out of the hundreds of cases that I've reviewed, the LifeProof Slam is the only one that does this, odd. Oddly enough, cases like OtterBox, which they claim to be very good in terms of being protective for your iPhone, uh, Apple will qualify the symmetry as a thick case and they don't have separators. In fact, the cuddle on the symmetry isn't even close to the minimum two millimeters, which according to this guideline is going to result in the case being a resonant chamber and detune the microphone and speaker frequency response. The last case I will mention for this section is the Tech 21 Evo Checks. As the bottom of the case is so sparse, it's so thin and there's, well, your iPhone is really exposed from my perspective, uh, but they definitely won't mess with the audio of your speakers. Well, because there's nothing there. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a set of tests for every one of these things that Apple um, provides a guideline for. And when it comes for speakers, it's one guy talking on the iPhone and the other guy sitting in another room on the landline talking to that guy on the iPhone. And that's generally how those uh, speaker tests go or microphone tests go. Now the sucker on the landline has to listen to the iPhone user say phrases like, glue the sheet to the dark blue background. The hogs were fed chopped corn and garbage. Large size and stockings is hard to sell. And those are actually test phrases from sort of some sort of electrical engineering standard, I believe, when it comes to audible devices. So, you know, it, it's, I didn't know about that, so cool. And one of the phrases I was really hoping to see was funnel fairy butter bar. Funnel fairy butter bar. Funny fu funnel fairy butter bar. Funny fu butter bar. What movie was that from? Before I move on to the camera section, if this is the first time you're watching my videos, subscribe, 
produce uh, content two to three times a week. If you want to know what I think are the best accessories for the iPhone 8 as well as the 10s, do check out that web post as I've listed everything that I've reviewed over the last few years and easy to read top 10 lists. The camera section is probably where I learned something new about iPhone cases. I've known all along that the shape of the cutout will have an effect on the case, but the color of the cutout along the surface finish will also have an effect. This totally makes sense, but that was something I never really thought about when I was looking at iPhone cases. In the document, there are several examples of how the image degrades through light blocking and flash issues. Now, Apple rec recommends a semi-gloss black material coating around the opening to ensure that light isn't reflected back into the camera, which is why we'll see this black ring along the camera cutouts on cases. This black ring on the Spec Procedo Grip has a slightly smoother finish than the rest of the case and isn't shiny, which minimizes the chances that light's going to be pointed back to the camera, which means better pictures. Cases that fail this guideline would include this Spigen Ultra Hybrid. The cutout is smooth, but it's shiny, but the angle of the cut is quite shallow, so I don't know if that makes uh, a difference. I do point this out because on the iPhone X's dimensional drawing, there is a minimum angle for the camera cone. So with the shallow cut of the Spigen Ultra Hybrid, it might actually not matter. I don't know. Now, cases that would definitely fail the camera uh, criteria case part would be any waterproof case and their tiny, tiny cutouts. The guideline that Apple puts out in their uh, guidelines, 200 page guideline book that I thought wouldn't have to be in there, but is, is the color fastness test. Basically it says dyes, inks, or coatings shouldn't bleed onto the color or the user, particularly while the case is in contact with common substances like water or sunscreen. I've yet to see a case bleed into my hand, but I do have tons of cheap cases that I bought from AliExpress. Uh, almost six weeks ago. It's taken a really long time to get here because they're coming on a boat, but I'm curious to know if those will bleed into my hands. We'll find out. Now I can understand why Apple would be fussy about accessories. I'm sure they don't want a bad case to dilute the iPhone user's experience. For example, all the guidelines for semi-gloss covers make sense for the cameras because people take so many pictures and having a case that degrades picture quality is going to result in people thinking that the iPhone takes bad cameras, not because the case is causing the photos to be poorer in terms of quality. I'm guessing it's the same with the uh, speaker cutouts and the mics. People are going to assume that they're talking on the iPhone and, the, and if it's muffled, it's going to be the iPhone's fault, not because the case, probably, you know, the $3 AliExpress special, that case is actually not properly designed and is messing around with the acoustics of the iPhone. People aren't probably going to blame the $3 case. They're going to blame the $1,000 device. Now that's just my opinion. Just based on what I've read and just how intera Apple interacts uh, with their consumers and with us, essentially. Uh, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It might not be. If you have any other opinions about it, leave in the comment section below. I'd like to know what you guys think about this. If this is the first time you're watching my videos, I do encourage you to click subscribe. Um, that's kind of all I got. Monty, it's time to go to bed because we're tired.